Okay, uh, so uh, my name is Colby Klein. I'm a master's student here at the WCVM taking a similar program as to what Mike and Jenna are taking. Uh, I'm being trained as a, an anatomic pathologist and today I'm going to be talking to you about two fungal diseases of honeybee uh, that is chalk brood and nosema disease. So we'll start with chalk brood. Uh, so chalk brood is a fungal disease of the brood caused by Aspospheria apis. It is an opportunistic and ubiquitous pathogen of brood that can infect all the casts. Um, it aggravates mortality in already stressful periods, uh, particularly uh, periods when there are fewer nurse bees and an issue in keeping the colony warm. It's quite common when you're walking about apiaries, you will often see this uh, as uh, mummies, uh, like you see in the top right of the screen here, these white uh, chalk uh, shaped uh, mummies that range from white to black or gray. Uh, and what those structures are, are late larvae and early pupa that have been overtaken by the uh, mass of fungi. Uh, they form a, a white mycelium of a regularly septate 4.5 micrometer diameter fungi uh, or hyphae. Uh, and they change color from white to mottled gray to black, depending on their formation of fruiting bodies, which you see in the bottom right of your screen here. Uh, this is the same species of fungus, uh, except in the bottom right, uh, there are uh, two sexes of the fungi because this, this is a, a heterothallic uh, fungus, which is basically means you need a, a positive and a negative strain to form these fruiting bodies. Uh, so the only difference between this top one and this bottom one is this bottom one has had more time to progress and is forming uh, these black fruiting bodies that are quite resilient and can survive for years in the colony. Uh, so like I said, uh, this is quite a common disease when you're walking throughout the apiary, uh, you will typically see uh, the front entrance of colonies marked by uh, an accumulation of these small uh, gravel or chalk uh, shaped um, firm bodies uh, that the bees have removed from the comb and tried to clean from the uh, colony. If you were to open the colony up, you may see an accumulation of more of these mummies along the bottom board. Uh, and if you were to look inside of the uh, brood frames themselves, you might see a spotty brood pattern with a number of uncapped mummies still within the brood cells. So what you see is a desiccated dead uh, late larva or pupa with a fungal uh, mycelium around it that looks white to gray. Um, and the bees will be in the process of removing these. It's important to differentiate this from two of the other um, very important brood diseases that we have seen today. Uh, on the upper right here, uh, we have one of the cardinal signs of American fall brood that Dr. Zabrowski showed us. Uh, that is these, uh, tenaciously adhered uh, flakes of uh, macerated uh, dead larvae that are stuck to the dependent side of the brood cell. And on the bottom right here, we have uh, the cardinal signs of uh, European fall brood that uh, Dr. Wood and Dr. Thabo uh, showed us uh, being these uh, discolored, flattened uh, uh, larvae that are dead on the bottom of the cell. Um, that's in contrast to what we'll see with this much less serious disease, uh, which is fungal mycelial mass occupying most of the uh, cell. Um, and it'll change color from white to gray, depending on how old the infection is. So how this disease progresses, uh, the fungal fruiting bodies produce a great number of very resilient uh, ascospores, which are easily transmitted throughout the hive. Uh, nurse bees will accidentally pick these up and feed them to larva. So in the right-hand corner here, we have a one-day-old hatch larva. So the queen will lay an egg. After three days, that egg will hatch, and this is what hatches out. Uh, the uh, larva is fed uh, from secretions of the nurse bees uh, in their, uh, their uh, mouth glands. Uh, they'll mix it with um, different components of the uh, pollen found in the hive. And what you're seeing in this picture is this uh, larva is swimming in its own diet. It's consuming the diet and you can see um, the pollen granules in the diet are accumulating in the gut. And what you're seeing here uh, is the larva has an incomplete uh, gut. So it's not actually connected uh, to the anus. It only actually fully connects uh, after the larva has eaten all of its food and is spinning a cocoon around day nine of age when it's been capped. And this makes sense when you think about it because the larva doesn't want to defecate before it's finished eating its food or else it's defecating in its own environment and its own food. Uh, this is important because usually uh, if there's a disruption in the normal development of the larva, 
during this period from uh, when it first hatches to when it's capped. Uh, one of those uh, consumed uh, spores will have a chance to uh, germinate and penetrate the gut wall. Uh, and from then it can overtake the pupil body if the environmental, con environmental conditions are favorable. Uh, and the things that make the environmental uh, conditions favorable are things like chilled brood, uh, which cause a, a delay in development. And eventually what will happen is that mycelium will overtake the entire body and replace it with that chalk white mummy that we saw. So histologically, what does it look like? Uh, basically the entire uh, late larva to pupa uh, is completely replaced by this uh, hyphal mass. Um, it is, forms a liquefactive necrosis throughout the entire body from gut wall to the uh, cuticle that you see here. This is the, uh, the skin, if you will, of the, of the pupa. And it's been completely replaced by these uh, fungal hyphae that you see here on the right. On the left here, this is just a, um, a low power magnification using the dissecting microscope of what uh, a healthy uh, bee would look like on the day it would emerge and what an infected uh, and overtaken uh, bee looks like after it's had a chance to sporulate. So you can see this looks like fuzzy uh, hyphal mass with a number of little black balls. And those are those uh, spore balls that contain many infective spores within them. Uh, so each of those black dots that you saw in that other picture, this is what they are. Uh, they're, each of those is one fruiting body filled with hundreds of spore balls, and each spore ball is comprised of hundreds or thousands of ascospores, and it's each one of those ascospores that is infective uh, to the larva. Um, in terms of what you need for a laboratory diagnosis, you typically will never need that because this is uh, a case where you can diagnose it based on gross examination of the hive. Um, if you absolutely need to differentiate uh, Ascosphera apis from other fungal diseases that can overtake a pupa like Aspergillus, uh, you can perform a wet mount and look for those fruiting bodies and that will help you differentiate them. Uh, or you can uh, grow them on a variety of media in the lab and, and there are PCR tests that have been developed in research settings for, for determining what uh, strain you're working with. Uh, in terms of control, we don't typically medicate for this. Uh, we will monitor and destroy or replace heavily contaminated equipment. Uh, and basically the, the main aim of this is prevention via good colony management. So preventing cool or damp uh, situations from developing in the hive, uh, which means avoiding or depopulating the hive. And if it becomes a problem in your apiary, importing queens that are uh, advertised as being hygienic and resistant to chalk root is advised. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about Nozema, and I'm going to only briefly discuss treatment because Dr. Igor Medici is going to be discussing that with us with some interesting uh, research into uh, comparing our typical chemotherapeutics with prebiotics and probiotics. So Nozema is a microsporidium parasite, and for those of us uh, who have been trained as veterinarians, uh, that might sound familiar. Microsporidia are a a uh, highly reduced and specialized uh, unicellular parasitic fungus. Uh, they were formerly classified as protozoa based on the morphology, but they were reclassified uh, to fungi based on uh, genomic evidence. They form a very tenacious, resilient environmental spore, uh, and their only uh, vegetative or their only metabolically active stage is their uh, vegetative intracellular uh, life, uh, life stage. Uh, most species inf infect insects, uh, but all major groups of animals can host. So we frequently see this in fish, as well as uh, my example here in rabbits, where we see encephalotozoan cuniculi here causing uh, uveitis, but also encephalitis and nephritis in rabbits. So nosomosis in bees, uh, it's a microsporidian uh, parasita parasitizing uh, of the midgut of the adult honeybee. So that's in contrast to the other diseases we've covered so far. Uh, we've mostly talked about brood diseases. This is, I think, our first uh, adult uh, bee disease, which makes it a bit more difficult to diagnose because typically when an adult honeybee is compromised by disease, uh, they don't leave signs because they'll, they'll die off somewhere that we don't see them. Uh, for our European honeybee, we typically think about Nozema apis as being uh, the pathogen we're most used to seeing. However, in the last 30 years, we've had a crossover event from the Asian honeybee uh, which is the reservoir host of Nozema serrani crossing over into the, the European honeybee population and causing some uncertainty and some concern with that. 
Uh, with either of these diseases, uh, most often it's just vague clinical signs that are downstream of the effects on the individual worker bees that are infected. Uh, and primarily what these, these microsporidians are causing in the adults are uh, energetic strain based on their paras uh, parasitism. Uh, with Nosema apis in particular, uh, one of the signs that we frequently associate with infection is dysentery. So on the right here, we have a photograph of the front entrance of a hive. And these drips that you see um, are bees that have uh, basically had diarrhea uh, and were unable to leave uh, the colony with sufficient time before uh, staining and, and defecating both within and in front of the hive. So this is not a normal finding. Uh, it suggests to us that there's something going on in the hive. So on the right here, this is uh, an EM uh, photo of a Nosema apis environmental spore. So Nosema apis, they form these environmental spores, which are quite tenacious and they can last in the environment. Um, they require uh, infection with a honeybee to reproduce, and they need to do this by uh, entering the ventricular epithelial cells. So the ventriculus is that mid-gut section that Ivana showed us about this morning. Uh, they, uh, are, they undergo fecal-oral uh, transmission, so a horizontal sort of transmission route, <clears throat> and they cause disease by Im imposing an energetic burden on the host. Uh, and what this causes is uh, effects on the individual that's infected. So with workers, we see uh, something called precocious foraging, where the jobs they're given are accelerated uh, in relation to their actual physical age. Uh, with Nosema apis, we typically see spikes in the spring and fall, and the spores of Nosema apis are slightly larger than the spores of that of uh, Nosema serrani. Uh, so like I said, uh, we see precocious foraging. Uh, as bees age, or as I should say worker bees age, they're given progressively more uh, dangerous diseases within the hive. So at the start of their life, they're given the job of a nurse bee or as a member of the queen's retinue. And as they age, they'll be given progressively more dangerous jobs, eventually becoming a forager, which is considered the most dangerous uh, job they can have where they're more uh, expendable. <clears throat> Nozema imposes a chronic nutritional stress, which causes changes <clears throat> to things like the hypopharyngeal gland, which reduces their brood feeding capacity. They'll begin orientation flights sooner, guard behavior and foraging earlier as well. And the queen can be affected by this either by being directly infected uh, and imposing that nutritional stress leading to reduced egg laying and pheromone production, or she can receive secondary effects by having a reduced worker retinue with their ability to care for her impeded. <clears throat> Uh, Nozema serrani, so like I said, this crossed over from the Asian to the Western honeybee sometime in the 90s. Uh, it has very similar histological lesions. In fact, we can't determine, uh, we can't tell the difference between what's infecting the ventriculus based on histology alone. Uh, their life cycle appears similar. Uh, there's uh, been some research that has found DNA of Nozema serrani outside of the ventriculus. However, we haven't correlated that with histo uh, histological findings yet. Um, Compared to Nozema apis, uh, the clinical findings are more nonspecific uh, for Nozema serrani, uh, more oriented towards immunosuppression and less so uh, for dysentery. Uh, there's a weaker seasonal correlation. There doesn't appear to be that fall and spring spike. And so uh, it's not as well understood in terms of its pathology as Nozema apis, uh, and its spores are uh, slightly smaller. So just uh, as a point by point comparison, um, in terms of important differences for us here today, uh, some things that'll help us differentiate are things like the spore size and shape. And uh, one of the morphological differences is the number of polar filament coils, which I'll go into in a minute, but this apparatus is what helps the Nozema parasite actually infect the ventricular cells. And it's coiled a number of times within the spore. In Nozema apis, it coils 30 times, and Nozema serrana, Coils about 20 times. Uh, Nozema apis is generally uh, more tolerant to freezing and less tolerant of high temperatures, whereas Nozema serrana is much more tolerant of high temperatures and much less tolerant of freezing. Uh, so just to go over the structures of what allows the Nozema parasite to actually infect the ventriculus, um, probably the most important structure is this uh, polar tube uh, that goes from one end, one pole of the spore uh, down and circles 
uh, the circumference of the spore numerous times and the number of times it actually goes around allows us to speciate what we're dealing with. Uh, this uh, polar tube acts as kind of like a harpoon to actually punch through the peritrophic membrane and ventricular cell membrane to actually infect the ventriculus of uh, the host. Uh, so what happens is for whatever reason, uh, the spore is able to detect uh, the chemical environment of the ventriculus. Um, the uh, hollow tube that is this polar filament uh, will erupt out of one pole of this spore uh, unravel the entire tube and all of the contents uh, of the spore will actually get forced through that tube and into the cytoplasm of the ventriculus. Uh, so I'll just briefly go over this because Ivana did a very good job of showing us this diagram this morning, but um, the part of the, uh, of the digestive tract that we're primarily concerned about is this, the ventriculus. This is where the majority of digestion takes place. You'll remember that everything uh, oral to this or before this uh, is to do more with storage, uh, temporary storage for the worker bees. Uh, and afterwards, the anterior intestine and rectum is actually responsible for holding the feces. And in the case of nosema, uh, we've packed with nosema spores and in infected bees. Uh, in terms of gross changes of infected bees, if it's a lighter moderate infection, we don't actually see any differences. However, for very heavily infected bees, this ventriculus may appear chalky, white, and friable, and you may lose those striations that you see, these crosshatch uh, pattern that we see uh, for the folds of the ventriculus, that can be lost in heavy infections. Uh, so I'm just gonna show you some histology of normal before I show you abnormal. Uh, so we'll see here, this is the ventriculus. On the right, this is a, a low power. On the left, this is a high power of one area of the ventriculus. Uh, going from the inside to the outside, the, the lumen to the uh, outer surface here, we have a peritrophic membrane. This was responsible for protecting the gut wall as well as holding digestive enzymes. On top of that, we have microvilli, which increases surface area of these epithelial cells. Uh, the microvilli are attached to the ventricular epithelial cells. Um, at the base <coughs> of the epithelial cells are ventricular uh, our mid-gut stem cells, and these are responsible for replenishing the uh, epithelial cells. And below that, we have a layer of muscle fibers, tracheals for gas exchange, and out here, you'll remember, uh, these are uh, the malpighian tubules. So what happens when a spore comes into the ventriculus? Um, the spore detects that it's in the right spot somehow. Uh, it launches this harpoon, this hollow harpoon, into the cytoplasm of the ventricular epithelium, injects the sporoplasm, which undergoes division in a, in a process called merogony, undergoes another division in a process called sporogony, and forms a number of spores, which can then erupt and infect uh, other epithelial cells or be shed into the environment in that dysentery that we saw. So this is, uh, on the right, a low-power uh, view of a heavily infected epithelium and on the left is a high power. So you can see the cytoplasm of the epithelial cells are heavily uh, infected. Uh, they're packed with these uh, spores which appear clear in this picture, um, but you see that only the epithelium itself is infected. They don't seem to go past those stem cells which we pointed out. And also importantly you'll notice uh, in the normal peritrophic membrane you can see it's quite uh, dense and intact, whereas in the infected uh, example here, it's it's quite wispy and it's been depleted. So this bee isn't doing very much digestion and absorption, um, which is part of the reason why it's imposing a nutritional stress. Uh, so um, if we crack open that hive with dysentery, we may see something like this, where there's quite a bit of fecal staining, this brown to black material across the top bore. And if we were to open up one of these frames, we would see fecal staining on the surface of these capped honey frames, which is very abnormal. Bees should not be doing this. It's not uh, pathognomonic for uh, nosema, but it is suggestive. So what we would do in a situation like this, we would collect about 60 bees using either uh, forceps or a vacuum. Uh, we would put 60 bees in 60 mils of water, so a one-to-one -one ratio, um, and we would macerate them. In this case, we use a, a rolling pin. Uh, we make sure they're all crushed. Um, we would take uh, a sample of that fluid and then we run it into a hemocytometer. So this is just a special slide that lets us load a certain volume of liquid into a grid 
and we get a picture something like this. So we count spores in each of the grid squares. And from that, we can rough out uh, just using, uh, we can calculate uh, the, the average number of spores per bee that we've collected. So um, from left to right here, we have a negative, um, a moderately infected. And then on the right here, this is a, an exceptionally high number of spores. You normally, this is quite spectacular for what you would normally see. Um, but this is how we would do a clinical diagnosis of nosomosis in a hive. And in Canada, at least, uh, what we decide to do is um, greater than 1 million spores per bee is the cutoff for our treatment with, uh, with a product called Fumagilla that we typically use here. Uh, so I'll just briefly touch on what we use for control in Canada, uh, because Igor is going to talk more about this in a moment. Um, aside from the chemical control that I mentioned, uh, promoting a strong spring buildup using fun, uh, supplemental feeding and insulated hives is generally recommended, especially for uh, cold climates like Canada. Uh, any infected uh, material doesn't necessarily have to be thrown out. Uh, in our laboratory, we use uh, we try to clean off most of the uh, diarrhea and then decontaminate the equipment with uh, concentrated acetic acid. And so this is a fumigation technique that's widely used to decontaminate equipment. Um, but however, um, like for uh, AFB, uh, you can use irradiation or uh, for um, Nosema apis, uh, you can use a heat treatment to inactivate the spores. Um, and then if you have that clinical cutoff for uh, more than 1 million spores per bee. Um, fumagillin is an antibiotic that can be used, uh, administered in syrup. Uh, this is in Canada and the, the EU and in the States. I don't think it's on label. I don't think you can use it in the EU. Uh, so there's other products out there, including prebiotics and probiotics uh, that Dr. Medici is going to be talking to us about. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it off to Igor. Um, and I hope you get for now. Okay, uh, let me put the, here Okay, just check with the video. Okay, do you guys hear me and see me fine? Yes, we can see you and hear you and see the presentation. Okay, <clears throat> so I'll talk about two experiments that we performed here at the uh, University of Saskatchewan, both of them addressing uh, Nuzema issues. Uh, in this one specifically, uh, we were interested in, in test uh, how efficient uh, different therapies are. Um, as Dr. Klein mentioned, the only recommended uh, treatment for Nozema is uh, uh, fumagillin, but this is an antibiotic and it can produce residues in the hives uh, products like uh, honey, pollen. So beekeepers are interested in finding different uh, or at least alternative ways to control Nozema, right? In this case, we, treat, uh, we tested bees uh, uh, in vitro, meaning that we took bees to the to the laboratory and um, just let me took bees to the laboratory. We put them in in those metal cages here, um, in which we introduced this syringe here, uh, filled with uh, sugar syrup to feed the bees. So it drips, and the bees will feed on this sugar syrup. And in this specific uh, uh, experiment. We introduced the bees to cages. After that, we uh, sampled few bees to check uh, their infection rates uh, of Nozema. So we have like a baseline of the Nozema infection. After that, we infected the bees with a known amount of Nozema spores. And subsequently, we treated them with five different um, uh, commercial formulations. Fumagillin, two different uh, probiotics and two different probiotics. And at the end, we repeated the measurement so we can uh, we could know like uh, how the, the treatment worked or not. Okay, here in this graph, we see that this dashed line represents the, the, the baseline. Uh, what was the, the infection rates with Nozema at the beginning of the experiment? And the boxes represent 
uh, the final uh, spore counts. Uh, here we see that we, we have a, a negative control group in which we, we neither treated and nor infected the bees. And we see that the final spore counts are basically aligned with the, the, with the one, with the, the spore counts at the beginning of the experiment, meaning that the, 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 in this group, the, the infection rates remain uh, stable. And this positive control group, we infected the bees, but we didn't treat them. Uh, and with that, we saw a very, the highest um, museum spore counts at the end, which was kind of expected. And all those other boxes here represent uh, different uh, formulations that we tested. And we see here that the only one that was able to keep the spore counts quite close to the, to the baseline, to, to, the, to the infection rates at the beginning of the experiment was fumagillin, showing that still fumagillin is the only effective way that we could detect to um, really control uh, nosema infection to reduce the spore counts and control nosema infection. Okay, moving on to a second experiment. Uh, in this one, we, we tested uh, colonies. So it was a field experiment and we were interested in testing the same uh, formulations, commercial formulations as a prophylactic treatment. In this case, we used uh, 120 colonies uh, divided in six different experimental groups. And we performed two treatments. Hi, Igor. Sure, go ahead. Hi, um, your screen's looking a bit fuzzy. We're not sure whether it's the internet connection or whether it's the resolution of the slides. Uh, uh, probably the internet. The on our computer, it's perfect. On the site, on our computer, it's perfect, but on the site, same blurry. Is there something that we can do to make it clear? And we are not. Uh, it's actually looking clear now. Okay, perfect. Should I go on? Yep, let's keep going. Okay. So uh, we were interested uh, in this experiment. We were interested in testing prophylactic treatment and check uh, how it interferes with nosema infection and the overwinter survival of those colonies that we tested. So again, uh, we tested 120 colonies uh, divided into six different groups. Uh, we tested treatments uh, two times uh, a year, one treatment during the spring and another during the fall. After that, we prepared uh, the bees for overwintering, uh, which is uh, quite a significant step here in, in Canada, right? And after this overwintering, we checked the survival uh, rates of the, the colonies we tested. Okay, here you see a survival graph. And this, we, in this graph, you can see that the control uh, group presented the, the lowest survival rates, meaning in this group, we, we, we haven't uh, treated the bees. Uh, this, this is the, the, the control group. Uh, and as expected, it presented the lowest survival rates, um, showing how important uh, prophylactic treatment against nozema is important here uh, in Canada. Um, here we see in, in the golden line here, that uh, the group treated with fumagillin presented quite good uh, survival rate, meaning that 82.3% of the colonies that uh, started the, the, the experiment survived overwintering when they were prophylactically treated with fumagillin. But in this case here, we see two probiotics working quite well, right? It means that we, we, you may probably ask why once in, in the previous uh, experiment, I showed that the probiotics uh, were not able to reduce the infection rates. But here we, we, we speculate that somehow they can produce beneficial, uh, um, they can be bene beneficial for the colonies, especially because they can kind of boost the, the immune system of the bees. And also perhaps they can, uh, 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 help to uh, 
beneficial bacteria to, to establish in the gut. And it can work as a barrier, uh, preventing nosemia infection, for example. So I believe the take home uh, message here would be, it's very important to treat prophylactically, uh, especially in climate conditions like uh, in Canada. And fumigilling is still a good option and it works, but uh, probiotics can also be somehow beneficial. And with that, I finish my talk and, and would like to acknowledge, especially my text and Saskatchewan Beekeeping, Beekeepers Commission for funding uh, those experiments. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, in, in this experiment, we, we couldn't find uh, any statistical significance. For now, it's an ongoing experiment, but it, it can help us to, to have like a, a good idea or at least a, a, a previous idea on how those uh, different treatments work. Okay, so should we use fumigilling in the fall prophylactically? Um, I would say yes. Uh, um, the uh, protocol should recommend at least two applications uh, during the fall and during the spring. Here in Canada, uh, we've been using this kind of protocol. Okay, uh, do you know what the withdrawal time for fumigilling is? Uh, I believe it, it, uh, uh, Elamir just said it's probably six weeks. Um, should we, do you have any comment to make about nutrient supplements such as nozavit that claim to strengthen the lining of the gut, which then resists penetration? Uh, yeah, in, in, well, uh, we tested uh, different uh, commercial um, formulations. And we saw that they can benefit, especially when it comes to um, immune system and, and probably uh, uh, the nutrition of the bees. But uh, we only saw actual uh, reduction of uh, uh, um, losing spore counts using fumigilling. Assuming a springtime uh, dead out, do Chinozima api skin frames with kept uh, honey be reused in other hives or are spores still present on the kept cell surfaces? Will acid, acetic acid contaminate the, the kept honey? Type off the majority of the, the diarrhea for the, for the acetic acid once you get contact with it. So you'll be probably scraping the surface of those honey cells. And then those honey cells will be probably used for your brood box, not for your actual honey uh, super in the future then. Uh, that's probably the best management practice, I would say, unless Elamir has some to add. There, there have been uh, done some uh, research uh, by, I believe, uh, Steve Purnell and, 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 and others. Uh, yes, and acetic, acetic acid, uh, I forgot what is it, 80% uh, or something like that. 90% and you put it in stag of the supers, it should help, but you need to first remove the majority.